Welcome back to the E Pluribus Unus Mundus series. In this episode, I'm going over the third paper in this series, and I'll be discussing Carl Jung's The Undiscovered Self, which the first draft of this came out in 1956, and he was talking about the, the power of state absolutism to crush the moral autonomy of individuals. This whole series of papers, E Pluribus Unus Mundus, is aimed at helping the left and the right of the United States unify by adding two amendments to the Constitution. The first is to identify each self with the gravitational singularity and it's encompassing the encompassing horizon of the cosmos. And that's based on Carl Jung's letter, I call it the Leap Day letter from 1952, wherein he equates psychic energy with mass. And the final sentence, his equation of psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space. So the highest intensity is infinite, the smallest space is zero. Infinite energy in zero volume, or infinite mass in compressed into zero volume, that's the definition of a gravitational singularity, according to general relativity. It has all kinds of effects on space and time, which I discuss in the paper. The Second Amendment to help unite the left and the right in the United States of America is to add a fourth branch of government to help the other three branches harmonize their decision-making processes with this unifying equation of the psyche and the gravitational singularity. I know that sounds very complicated. If you haven't watched any of the other videos, that's going to really sound bizarre to you. I go over all of the details of this philosophy in my book, Psyche and Singularity, Jungian Psychology and Holographic String Theory. And I've reiterated the basics of this in each of these videos, so I will review some of the basics as I go through uh, Carl Jung's book here. So, I'm scrolling through, this is the third paper in the E Pluribus Unus Mundus series. In the previous video I went over the same third paper and I talked about Martin Luther King, St. Thomas Aquinas's natural law theory, and how Aquinas says that this outermost horizon of the cosmos is where the angels live. So I, I mentioned how a lot of people in the United States of America believe in God, believe in angels, more so than in Europe, and you know, how do I get people to take the mental effort to examine the ideas that I'm presenting here as a solution to our the split consciousness of the United States. You know, it can be dry, it can seem overwhelming, but a thing like angels, in, in, it piques people's interest. Oh, this will describe how the belief in angels can be scientifically grounded, and I believe it can. It's rooted to natural rights because Aquinas was the founder of natural law theory and he specifically talks about this outermost horizon where God exists and the angels. So I talked about that. In this one, we're talking about the undiscovered self. In the next video, I'll finish off discussing this third paper in the series by going over Leo Strauss's book, Natural Right and History. So this is the undiscovered self, 1956. That was the first draft of this book. It was the same year that Congress in the United States changed the national motto from E Pluribus Unum, from many one, to In God We Trust. Because the United States was in a Cold War with the Soviet Union. It was God and capitalism versus atheism, you know, Marxist atheism and communism in Russia. So that split between communism and quasi-Christian capitalism. This is some of the things that Jung is discussing in his book. And he's talking about, this is a quote, uh, the spiritual and moral darkness of state absolutism. All right, mass-mindedness. This is what he talks about. Uh, the belief, and this is my words, just summarizing what he says, the belief that when in the hands of the appropriate political party, the awesome organizational and military power of the state can solve all of the problems of human society, or at the very least, the belief that masses, the masses cannot be resisted effectively. All right, that's mass-mindedness. Either you believe that the state, which organizes the masses, can solve all of human, human problems, or if you think, no, the state being powerful 
is inherently corrupt, but what can you do? You can't resist this power of the organized mass. The herd, when organized appropriately, is unstoppable. And that crushes the idea of individual moral autonomy according to Carl Jung. And he's talking about how this state absolutism has completely overwhelmed the communist nations, but the same thing is happening in the Western nations, which are furthermore suffering from a split consciousness between the Judeo-Christian tradition and the atheistic materialism of the modern era. So this is, these are the things that he's talking about. But what he, he says, this statist, uh, the statist attitude, he compares it repeatedly to a psychic epidemic, a psychic infection like cholera, it spreads all the more rapidly, the less, the less people are aware that they are infected. So psychic epidemic, psychic infection, and cholera. These are quotes from the book. This is how he sees this mass-mindedness. Just like the body can have an epidemic, the coronavirus shut down the world for a year, the mind, the subtle body, can have psychological epidemics. And I think we're seeing that, that the, there's the coronavirus epidemic, and at the same time, there's this mass-mindedness epidemic, which is splitting the United States in particular between the left and the right. And I'm trying to say, how are we going to deal with that? All right, but let me uh, read here from The Undiscovered Self. And this is, I'm looking at the, uh, this is from page four. So this is the book, The Undiscovered Self, but I'm reading from this third paper in the series here. So the mass crushes, this is Carl Jung, the mass crushes out the insight and reflection that are still possible with the individual, and this necessarily leads to a doctrinaire and authoritarian tyranny if ever the constitutional state should succumb to a fit of weakness. So I'm going to read that again. The mass crushes out the insight and reflection that are still possible with the individual. Once you start guiding yourself by what the masses say is good and evil, then your individual moral autonomy gets crushed smaller into a smaller and smaller and, and more insignificant position. So continuing, he says, rational argument can be conducted with some prospect of success only so long as the emotionality of a given situation does not exceed a certain critical degree. If the effective temperature rises above this level, the possibility of reasons having any effect ceases and its place is taken by slogans and chimerical wish fantasies. That is to say, a sort of collective possession results which rapidly develops into a psychic epidemic. Under these conditions, all those elements whose existence is merely tolerated as asocial under the rule of reason come to the top. I think we see that happening in the United States of America. The, the, the opposition between the left and the right is becoming ever more violent. And the asocial tendencies, which are tolerated on the margins in normal times, are now leading the show. They've risen to the top. And what Carl Jung is saying about Europe and, and, and the United States as well in 1956, but he was focusing more on Europe, is playing out in the United States of America, I think, with a vengeance today. So what he's saying here is very pertinent to our situation. So the collective possession overwhelming both sides of the left and the right divide. You get carried, your individuality gets swept away in identifying with one enormous group of millions of people versus another. And this idea of a rational argument can be conducted with some prospect of success only so long as the emotionality of a given situation does not exceed a certain critical degree. So this feverish emotion crushes the possibility of rational conversation. Where does all this energy come from? If, if you question somebody who's identifying mainly with the left or the right, if you question the dogma of that particular political party, the emotional temperature rises immediately. And then there's no more reasoning because being possessed. But where does that energy come from? Carl Jung says from the archetypes of the collective unconscious mind. That's the power that they give us the energy to do everything. They're the root 
causes of, of all form in the material world and all dynamism. We have to understand these archetypes and how they possess us. And one thing is that there's a collective unconscious mind. We all have the same archetypes of the collective unconscious. They culminate with the archetype of the self, the psychic image of which is a mandala, which is a circle or a sphere with a central point. I'm identifying the inside out black hole of the universe itself with a central singularity and the holographic horizon of the cosmos with the self, the self archetype. The collective unconscious is this holographic horizon where the past, the present, and the future are conserved. And with the cosmic microwave background radiation, it radiates on these fundamental elastic threads of energy, this cinematic hologram of this world that we live in. The ego consciousness lives in a three-dimensional world of holographic illusion the reality being out at the horizon of the cosmos. Carl Jung had a near-death experience in 1944 where he, ex he went to the cosmic horizon, his disembodied consciousness. When he returned, he said, it, feel, it seemed to me as if each of us lives in our own little cubic box of illusion, tethered to the horizon by a thread, and that at the horizon of the cosmos, the past, the present, and the future are blissfully conserved. Okay, so... The, um, the archetypes that possess people from the left and the right. People from the left have the same archetypes as people from the right and vice versa. And what is happening is each side oppresses the archetypes that the other side hails most vigorously. And then each side, we'll see, according to Carl Jung, projects their shadow onto the other. So neither side lives in reality. They live in a kind of a half reality and their individuality it gets suffocated, it dissolves in the sea of mass-mindedness, in this collective possession. So continuing here, this is, this is Carl Jung's The Undiscovered Self. This is from pages 55 and 56 of my edition. He says, It is in the nature of political bodies always to see the evil in the opposite group, just as the individual has an ineradicable tendency to get rid of everything he does not know and does not want to know about himself by foisting it off on somebody else. Nothing has a more divisive and alienating effect upon society than this moral complacency and lack of responsibility, and nothing promotes understanding and reproachment more than the mutual withdrawal of projections. So this is an enormously important point. It is the nature of the human being the ineradicable tendency. You cannot uproot this tendency to project your shadow side onto other people. That is what humans do. Carl Jung is saying you should acknowledge that you will always do that, but then learn that you're doing that and then withdraw the projections. You can see, oh, this is my opposition. Oh, I have these negative emotions about this person. I'm seeing this person as evil or all these negative adjectives. All right, are they really that bad? Probably not. Certainly I'm projecting some of my own unacknowledged shadow onto them. And then you can adjust and, and account for that. And he says, nothing is more divisive and alienate, alienating than projecting your shadow just irresponsibly and not even realizing you're doing that. And he says, nothing promotes understanding and reproachment more than withdrawing those projections. So the root cause of the division is this projection of the shadow on the other. And the solution is to withdraw the projections. But how do you do that? You have to have an understanding of the psyche. To have an understanding of the psyche, you have to have an understanding of the cosmos. And this is what we're going to get into. All right, but in my commentary on, on Jung's, on that quote there, I say each of us contains the seeds of all the same ideologies, it's the archetypes of the collective unconscious, which I say exist interwoven at the holographic horizon of the cosmos. So we have the same archetypes of these left-wing and right-wing ideologies, which means that every conservative is in some sense a latent liberal and vice versa, although each side tends to suppress the archetypes embraced most enthusiastically by the other. Okay, and then I say that uh, each side furthermore projects their collective shadow, the unflattering instincts they prefer not to recognize in themselves on the other, thereby alienating themselves from a realistic estimation of the actual situation, each seeing in the other the absolute incarnation of evil, idiocy, and conformism. So I think it's safe to say that most hardcore Republicans see 
most hardcore Democrats as the absolute incarnation of evil idiocy and conformism, and vice versa. Most hardcore Democrats would say the exact same thing about Republicans. And if Carl Jung is correct, and these people are projecting their shadow onto the other, both of them are falling prey to this conformist mass-mindedness, which we need to protect ourselves from. So Carl Jung is going to go on and tell us how to do that. All right, here's another big point that the, the all right, so I say within it, any group, each member's sense of personal responsibility is in an inverse proportion to its population. The more people are, that are in your group, the less individual moral responsibility you feel for what your group does. So if you identify yourself with one or the other political party that has millions of members, then your sense of individual responsibility for what that group does becomes almost zero. And then Jung says, a million zeros joined together do not unfortunately add up to one. So you, how, how can you have these massive political parties if you want to have any effect in the political world? You have to join them, one or the other, or you don't have to, but that would, is the most obvious path. But if you do that, then you run the risk of having your individual moral autonomy crushed by mass-mindedness. Well, how can you resist this almost irresistible force? Uh, well, one thing is acknowledge this idea of projecting the shadow on your opponents. First of all, realize the risks involved with identifying with any group. Your moral autonomy will tend to be reduced. If you realize that effect, then you can bolster your, yourself against it. And I'm giving a, a, some advice here about how to admit that you project your shadow on others you know, it seems like, oh, I don't project my shadow on others. That would mean that I'm morally weak and that I'm unenlightened about myself. And I don't want to admit that about myself. So no, I don't project my shadow on anyone. Well, Jung says it's ineradicable. So you shouldn't be ashamed to admit, yes, I project my shadow constantly on other people. You should see that is inevitable and then use that as a psychological tool. Oh, okay. I need to know myself. Well, there's parts about myself that I don't want to see. All right, that's not a problem. I'll show you how you can see it. Just find out who you hate the most, and then you'll have a, that's the projection, the projection screen for what you hate about yourself. They very well might be guilty of the crimes that you're accusing them of, but that extra added emotional animosity, it's being amplified by the fact that you see in them things that remind you of the things that you don't want to admit about yourself. So then you can clean yourself. I was, the image I had thinking of this when I was preparing for this video as a bird. Birds are always cleansing themselves, cleaning out their wings so that they can fly appropriately and humans should do the same thing with our psyche. We should always be cleansing our mind and one of the most effective ways to do that is to cleanse ourselves of these shadow projections. Realize we're doing that, counteract the fact that we're doing that. And then I say it seems much easier to admit that we project our shadows on each other unconsciously when we realize that our collective unconscious mind is the cosmic horizon that projects the universe into existence. Projection is the essence of the world in which we live and we are its co-creators. So I'm identifying each self with the central singularity in the horizon of the cosmos. This apparent three-dimensional world that we live in that evolves over time is a holographic illusion being projected from the horizon of the cosmos on these fundamental threads. That's the essence of the world we live in is projection. The self projects. These collective unconscious archetypes project the material, illu the illusion of a material world into existence. We are one with this omnicentric singularity and its holographic horizon, which is our collective and conscious mind. So it's, of course, we project things into existence. That's just the way the world works. There's nothing shameful about that. What's shameful is to not know that and then project your shadow onto other people and not acknowledge it and have other people carry the weight of all of your sins. In the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus said, why are you so concerned with pointing out the speck in your neighbor's eye when you have a beam sticking out of your own eye. It's, it's, it's commenting on this fact of psychological projection. 
Okay, so continuing here with Carl Jung, this is from page 19 of The Undiscovered Self, my edition. He says, confronting this development in the 20th century of our Christian era, the Western world stands with its heritage of Roman law, the treasures of Judeo-Christian ethics grounded on metaphysics, and its ideal of the inalienable rights of man. Anxiously, it asks itself the question, how can this development be brought to a standstill or put into reverse? The development of mass-mindedness, where individuals are absorbed in the mass-minded herd. And so he talks about this, this Christian heritage of Roman law, Judeo-Christian ethics, and the idea of inalienable rights. So in the previous video, I talked about how the idea of unalienable rights, the way Thomas Jefferson described it in, our, in the Declaration of Independence for the, of the United States of America, is based on natural law theory, which is based on Thomas Aquinas's philosophy. I'm not going to go over that again here because it's, I did it in the previous video. But how can this development be brought to a standstill? How can we stop this encroachment of state absolutism on the individual? So I write here, we can reverse the encroachment of state absolutism on the individual in the United States of America by constitutionally equating the individual with the omnicentric singularity and its holographic horizon and establishing a fourth branch to integrate the other three with that infinitely solid definition of the indissoluble self. A gravitational singularity is infinitely solid. People use the word solidarity. How can we establish solidarity among the citizenry? Well, if you take that idea of solidarity to its infinite extreme and thereby bring it back to the archetype from which it's projected, you will find this gravitational singularity. If each of us is one with the omnipresent singularity, and why it's omnipresent I discuss in, in the previous videos and in the book Psyche and Singularity, we're all one. E pluribus unum from many one. Well, also unum e pluribus from one many. The one, and that's what Carl Jung calls the ultimate archetype of the self. He calls it the God archetype and the one and unus mundus, which means one world. That's where I get the title for this series of papers. That this idea of the singularity if you see your opponent and you as both partaking in the ultimate archetype of the self defined as the central singularity and horizon of the cosmos then we are one yes we're individual but somehow simultaneously we are all infinitely condensed into one single archetypal self acknowledging that should theoretically at least trigger the instinct of self-love towards others. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus said. Freud said, that's an impossible demand. You're just setting people up for neurosis. How can you love somebody as much as you love yourself because you have an instinct of self-love? Now, you might love your children as much as yourself because there's an instinct to do that. But your neighbor, or worse yet, your enemy, how are you going to love your enemy as yourself? If you truly believe that you and your enemy are rooted in the same supreme self, then without any moral effort, if you truly believe it, your instinct should automatically embrace your enemy as yourself. These inst because instinct is the flip side of archetypes. Archetypes are the patterns of perception through which we perceive the world. They're also the sources of the world we perceive, and instincts are the patterns of behavior that are related to these patterns of perception. So Carl Jung, one of his examples was the yucca moth. It has an archetypal image of the yucca flower. When it sees a yucca flower, that resonates with this archetypal image, which then triggers this instinctive pattern of behavior, which it could never have learned from anybody because its parents are dead before it's born, yet it has this intricate knowledge of how to lay its eggs so that's so the instinct of self-love is rooted in an archetype of the self if you include everybody in that archetype you should be able to love others all right so it's an important point but let me continue here continuing so earlier in the essay 
So what page is this? From page 14, Jung says that the individual who is not anchored in God can offer no resistance on his own resources to the physical and moral blandishments of the world. For this, he needs the evidence of inner transcendental experience, which alone can protect him from the otherwise inevitable submersion in the mass. The individual who is not anchored in God will be dissolved in mass-mindedness. So, God. The separation of church and state, which is integral to our Constitution, it's in the First Amendment, doesn't mean that God has to be separate from state. Any particular denominational revealed religion should not hold any particular sway over the government. But the idea of God is the national motto. So the separation of church and state does not mean the separation of God and state. God is, whether God exists or not, God is currently included as a part of our Constitution. So Jung is going to go on to say, you know, what do I mean by God? Well, whether there's some transcendental God or not, there's an archetypal understanding in the human psyche of God. And Carl Jung did believe in God. Um, but, so let me just continue reading here. So he says, here each of us must ask, have I any religious experience and immediate relation to God? And hence that certainty which will keep me as an individual from dissolving in the crowd. All right, so then he'll go on to say, I put the word God in quotes in order to indicate that we are dealing with an anthropomorphic idea whose dynamism and symbolism are filtered through the medium of the unconscious psyche. Anyone who wants to can at least draw near to the source of, each of such experiences, no matter whether he believes in God or not. All right, so God, the archetype, the God archetype. It, Jung says, whether you believe in God or not, you have this archetype in your collective unconscious mind. And you can draw near to it, he says. So he talks about the dynamism and symbolism of the God archetype. The, the dynamism is that the function of the God archetype or the self archetype or the unus mundus or the one, those are all synonyms for Jung, is to unite opposites. Whenever a psyche is torn between opposing demands, the collective unconscious compensates the, the, psych, the conscious ego with mandala imagery. During dreams and fantasies, images of mandalas, circles or spheres with a central point, furthermore, are often divided into four quadrants. This through empirical observation of, his, of analyzing his patients, his own dreams, and, and the historical record, Jung said, whenever this happens to a human psyche, the tendency for the collective unconscious is to compensate that ego with mandala symbolism. I'm saying that the collective psyche of the United States of America. So Jung says the psyche of a society follows the same basic psychological rules as the individual psyches that make it up. So looking at the United States of America as one psyche, it's being pulled between the opposing demands of the left and the right. We should expect the collective unconscious, if Carl Jung is correct, to compensate us with some unifying mandala image. I am saying that the superimposition of of Leonard Susskind's holographic string theory image of the universe, which is an inside-out black hole, it's nature's perfect mandala, a two-dimensional sphere encompassing a mathematical point, superimposing that model of the cosmos onto Jung's mandala model of the psyche, that is the mandala image emerging now to help unite the left and the right of the United States of America. And that the Constitution is the blueprint for the psychic structure of society and to individuate the constitution. So individuation for Jung is the goal of psychic development. It comes usually in the latter half, the second half of life, after you've met at least the minimum demands of society to withdraw yourself from the demands society makes on you and from the demands that your instinctive animal nature makes upon you. Withdraw from those and say, I am unique from those and then re-embrace them understanding that you and all of society and all of the animal world and all of the instincts and archetypes that animate them all they're all rooted in the archetype of the self that's individuation the god archetype uniting realizing that you're an individual but that you're indissolubly united with everybody else 
by virtue of everyone else being compressed in and radiating from this ultimate archetype of the self, which he's here calling God. Okay, so, continuing, Jung says that religious experiences exist no longer needs proof, but it will always remain doubtful whether what metaphysics and theology call God and the gods is the real ground of these experiences. The question is idle, actually, and answers itself by reason of the subjectively overwhelming numinosity of the experience. Anyone who has had it is seized by it, and therefore not in a position to indulge in fruitless metaphysics or epistemological speculations. Absolute certainty brings its own evidence and has no need of anthropomorphic proofs. Okay, religious experiences exist. I don't think anybody would deny that. What some people would say is, yeah, religious experiences exist, and they are symptoms of insanity. Even religious people probably wouldn't deny that because religious insanity is the goal, for example, for Plato, divine madness, uh, the losing your mind and love for God. But there's different types of insanity. There's, you know, there's just a negative kind of religious psychosis. But at any rate, there are very powerful emotions that emerge from this idea of God which is rooted in the human psyche. This is what Jung is saying. And he's saying for the individual to be able to resist the power, the dissolving power of the mass mind, of party politics, the individual has to have a relationship to this ultimate archetype of God, which has this numinous power. This numinous means giving you an, an idea of God, of the all-powerful supernatural force of God. It's this mysterious kind of hair-raising sensation. I think most people have had some at least small inkling of this numinous experience through what Carl Jung calls synchronicities, meaningful coincidences, or even deja vu. You go through a little scenario in your world, you're like, I've been through that before. This is replaying a movie. It gives you the sense that there's some overarching, all-powerful entity that's organizing things, this numinous experience. So Jung is saying you have to have access to this kind of numinous energy for the psyche to be able to resist the dissolving power of the mass mind. All right, and then he talks about this overwhelmingly subjective feeling of certainty. Then in, in the paper I say, well, on the other hand, in 1944, during his near-death experience, when Carl Jung felt his body rise above, I mean, his psyche rise above the earth, a thousand miles above the earth, in the end, when he returned to his body, he said it seemed to him as if each of us is imprisoned in a little cube of illusion tethered to the horizon of the cosmos by a thread, and then out at that horizon, that's where the past, the present, and the future are interwoven blissfully, and he would experience this every night for the next three weeks for about an hour after midnight, he came to the conclusion that one is interwoven into an indescribable whole and yet observes it with complete objectivity. So he said this was an objective fact, and these are what a lot of near-death experience recollections say, that once, you're out, once you've experienced this, there's no more doubt, and it's not subjective, it's objective, because you become one with the entire universe. It's not your subjective opinion anymore because your subjective opinion merges with all of the cosmos. So whether you believe that or not, I'm using this as evidence for what we should do to help cure this, this extreme tension between the left and the right in the United States of America. I also say even if there is no God and we live in a meaningless universe, Okay, well then you're free to say whatever you want because you have no moral obligation to say the truth. This is a point Nietzsche made out uh, that, oh, you don't believe in God? Well then, okay. Oh, you don't believe in God? Why? Because you believe in the truth? Oh, that's funny. Truth. What's truth? It's just another absolute transcendental idea like God. So, but my point here for this is what we need to begin to reconcile the left and the right is to have rational conversations with each other and define the terms that we use. When each side accuses the other of being evil, okay, well, what's your standard of the good? 
Is there a universal standard of what is right and wrong? The right wing would tend to say, yes, it's in the Bible, or it's in the Quran, or it's in whatever particular religious book of revealed wisdom a person might subscribe to. But the problem with, with that is, well, how do you prove that scientifically? You can't, in the United States, use those revealed religions as a source of law. That would violate the First Amendment. People on the left tend to say, no, there's no absolute moral standard. It's culturally relative. What's good for some cultures is evil for the other. And yet, despite that relativistic philosophy, people on the left tend to have a very moral absolutist idea of what is evil and what is good. And what is evil is the people on the right. Absolutely. Well, that's a contradiction. We'll talk about that when we go over Leo Strauss's natural right and history in the next video. But defining your fundamental terms, and the most fundamental term of all is the self. What is a self? I'm saying if we can only agree on that one point, then we can build a whole worldview from that. But we have to have some fundamental point of agreement from which we can in, in, engage each other in a rational dialogue about how to move the country forward. That's what the fourth branch will help the other three branches do. Define your terms, f beginning with the self. Now, how is your public policy position consistent with that definition of the self and give the reasons why. And if you apply a moral principle in one area to one particular scenario, then your, your opposition says, but you don't apply the same moral standard when it's over here on this other issue, which would shed a negative light on your political party. So the fourth branch would point that out. You have to be consistent with the words that you use. That's all the fourth branch would have the power to do. You can't, the fourth branch I'm saying doesn't legislate anything. That's the job of Congress, of the House and the Senate. But the fourth branch can keep the conversations between the two parties in these other branches on track on a, in a reasonable conversation so that tricks, rhetorical tricks won't be able to be used. You can't use the same word in different ways in different situations. You have to have a trained mediator to make sure everybody's on the up and up and is a sincere actor. In another paper, I'm going to write about Jürgen Habermas, his idea of communicative action. This is what the fourth branch will do, but it's much more plausible if we can at least begin from some common point of agreement. And then I'm saying is psyche equals singularity. All right, so continuing here, <clears throat> Jung says, you have to have some direct experience of God to resist the mass-mindedness. He goes on to say, however, that if you don't have um, a direct experience, then at least you have to have access to some numinous symbol that will serve as its substitute. So he says, if it wants to reach, it is the ego. If it, the ego, wants to reach the goal of synthesis, meaning uniting opposites, and which can only be done when you acknowledge that all these opposite points of view emerge from archetypes which are in our collective unconscious. It must experience them, the archetypes. Um, it, all right, so if it wants to reach the goal of synthesis, it must first get to know the nature of these factors, the archetypes. It must experience them or else it must possess a numinous symbol that expresses them and leads to their synthesis. A religious symbol that comprehends and visibly represented what is seeking expression in modern man might possibly do this, but our conception of the Christian symbol to date has certainly not been able to do so. All right, a numinous symbol. So the symbol of the God archetype is the mandala. Jung said this was his greatest realization of all. So the cross, the Christian symbol, he said, is not, it's not showing itself capable of uniting the opposites of the left and the right in Europe. Maybe some other religious symbol can. So the mandala is a universal religious symbol of the God archetype. I point out how in the Western tradition, starting with Plato, Plato said there is this universal soul. It's located in the central point of the spherical universe and at each point of the encompassing horizon where all of the absolute ideas exist. He says that in the Timaeus, also in the Phaedo and in the Republic. If you combine those three dialogues in particular, you get the spherical model of the universe with a soul, the universal soul in the center and at each point. 
of the encompassing sphere where the absolute ideas exist. St. Augustine said yes, and those absolute ideas are the ideas in God's mind, and that outermost horizon is the mind of God, also called the city of God, and the, which is Jerusalem, the spouse of God. So that symbol, which was the medieval symbol of the cosmos and the psyche in the Western tradition, and you can find the same symbol in, in the Eastern tradition, that symbol, I'm saying, can save us from this spirit-crushing mass-mindedness that is choking out all free thought in the United States of America today. So I say, I maintain that an amendment establishing the psyche equals singularity equation in the Constitution can harness the infinite energy of that ultimate symbol of God and concentrate it in a legal definition of each individual self, thereby providing the appropriate bulwark against the rising sea of mass mindedness, which manifests in the form of a widespread social neurosis, a split of consciousness between the left and the right. All right, so continuing with Jung, he says, the danger of infection, so the infection of mass mindedness, which chokes out moral autonomy of the individual. The danger of infection is greater when decisive importance is attached to large numbers and statistical values. Large numbers and statistical values. The poll, the most recent poll says, the most recent poll says this, that is what controls politics, which is what controls everybody else. And the danger of the infection of mass mindedness is greater when the decisive importance is attached to large numbers and statistical values, as is everywhere the case in our Western world. So he was talking in 1956, even more so is that true in 2021. So the suffocating power of the masses is paraded before our eyes in one form or another every day in the newspapers. And the insignificance of the individual is rubbed into him so thoroughly that he loses all hope of making himself heard. Paraded before our eyes in one form or another every day in the newspapers and out today, every day on the television, every day on the social media, every day on Twitter and every day on Facebook and every day on every other mass media outlet. The danger of infection of mass mindedness is higher than ever and we see it manifesting in the ever increasingly violent opposition between the left and the right. So continuing, Jung says, resistance to the organized mass can be affected only by the man who is as well organized in his individuality as the mass itself. I fully realize that this proposition must sound well nigh unintelligible to the man of today, the helpful medieval view that man is a microcosm, a reflection of the great cosmos in miniature, has long since dropped away from him. Okay, resistance to the organized mass. The masses are organized. Who's organizing them? The political parties. So how do you resist this submersion in party mass mindedness? You have to be as well organized in your individuality as the masses are by the political parties who manipulate them. Well, how do you organize your individuality? You have to just become conscious of it. And what's the ultimate organizing principle? of the individual, according to Jung, it's the mandala symbol of the God archetype. Realizing that each of us is an eternal, individual, infinitely dense point of energy that encompasses the entire universe, past, present, and future, and that we are therefore automatically one with the encompassing horizon of the cosmos, that mandala image will organize your understanding of cosmos and psyche. Cosmos and psyche is the title of a book by Richard Tarnas. That mandala framework of the universal self and each individual's relationship to it, I'm saying is the most effective way you can resist the mass mindedness of party politics. And that we should take this antidote to mass mindedness and insert it into our constitution, the psychic structure of the nation and that can trigger the next level of psychic development, which Jung calls individuation, which is achieved by uniting the opposites. Unite the conscious with the unconscious mind. And then all the unconscious mind, the collective unconscious, is made of all these archetypal opposites. And unite all of them, beginning in the political world with the left and the right. Each of them is motivated by an archetype or by a, a, a complex of archetypes. 
all of those archetypes are inherent in each of us. To become fully individuated or fully developed, you have to embrace all of the archetypes. The only effective way to do that is to realize how they're all radiating from the archetype of the self and how they're all ultimately trying to evolve back towards that archetype of the self. When you realize that the political party that you despise is motivated by an eternal archetype that's rooted in yourself as well, but that you're repressing it, that gives you a motivation to try to listen to the opposition if for no other reason than to discern the archetype that's motivating what you might perceive as their distorted interpretation of that archetypal truth. And you can you know, separate the, the wheat from the chaff and just find that archetypal source, which is divine in as much as it's rooted in the God archetype, and embrace it. That the fourth branch can help us do this. So that, and, and this medieval view that man is a microcosm, the, the great cosmos in miniature, that can be resurrected when we realize that the individual is this gravitational singularity. Each of us is the great cosmos in miniature. And when you have a near-death experience, as Carl Jung just had in 1944, as Eben Alexander experienced, in, I forget, 2008 or so, the, the Harvard neurosurgeon who was converted from an agnostic to believing in an all-loving God. Many of these near-death experiences, people say, I became one with the whole cosmos. So that helpful medieval view that man is a microcosm should be re-embraced based on the parallels between Jungian psychology and holographic string theory, which furthermore unites the opposite languages of general relativity, the theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics, the theory of the very small innards of an atom. That opposition, which gave some evidence for Carl Jung's theory, the opposition between general relativity and quantum mechanics, which defined 20th century physics after the discovery of quantum mechanics, it was resolved, true to Jung's prediction, with his partner Wolfgang Pauli, the Nobel Prize winning co-founder of quantum mechanics, it was resolved in the mandala of a black hole. A gravitational singularity is, in, uh, is infinite, a uh, point of infinite gravity, so there's general relativity, and yet it's infinitely small, there's quantum mechanics. They're forced to unite in this nature's perfect mandala. So it's just this perfect support for Jung and Pauli's theory. So perfect that I'm saying it warrants a constitutional upgrade. And that it's no coincidence that this option is emerging now just when we need it most, because that's the nature of the psyche. Until you have this energy of this extreme tension between opposites, the mandala won't emerge. But now this tension, the silver lining of that is, is it's forcing this compensatory mandala image that compensates people through all ages to emerge in the United States of America today, I am saying, in this, this series of papers that I'm writing, as well as elsewhere, it was emerging when Leonard Susskind in, inadvertently rediscovered this medieval worldview. I'm saying this, this, that all of the evidence suggests this is what the collective unconscious God archetype wants us to do. Maybe not exactly what I'm saying, but it's, it's definitely whatever solution we come to, in my opinion, is going to be something to do with this holographic string theory, this mandala image of the cosmos and the self. Just based on what Carl Jung is saying and how, how true his prophecies seem to me to be coming, um, how they seem to be coming true so obviously today. So continuing in the undiscovered self, this is from page 41 and 42, he says, the rupture between faith and knowledge is a symptom of the split consciousness which is so characteristic of the mental disorder of our day. So faith and knowledge, religion and science. Before I finish that quote, actually, I, I put here on these uh, end notes here, um, Sartre. So here's what um, the existentialist atheist Jean-Paul Sartre said. He says, the existentialist on the contrary thinks it very distressing that God does not exist because all possibility of finding values in a heaven of ideas disappears along with him. There can no longer be an a priori good since there is no infinite and perfect consciousness to think it. So he was alluding to Plato's theory of the absolute idea of the good which exists 
in the central point of the universe and at each point of the encompassing sphere, which Augustine called the mind of God. These absolute standards of good and evil only exist if there's an infinite and omnipresent perfect consciousness to think it. If there's no God, then there is no moral standard. It's all a matter of human choice. What you consider to be good or evil is not rooted in the cosmos. It's just your own free expression of whatever you want to say. That's what Jean-Paul Sartre says, and he says, and that's why it's so distressing. And yet it's also the, the opens the door to freedom and, and developing your own future. Okay, I'm saying to atheists, installing the amendments that I'm suggesting does not prevent anybody from employing this kind of atheistic existentialism that Sartre is talking about. You don't have to believe that the psyche equals the singularity, but you should understand that if we don't all use common definitions for our most fundamental terms, then we can have no mutual understanding. So if there's no God and there's no absolute truth, then there's no moral problem with asserting as some kind of a noble lie or a pragmatic proclamation that let's reason with each other based on the working assumption that each of us is one with this gravitational singularity. At least that would keep everybody on the same page and you can understand what people are trying to say. If, if all the ideas of morality and religion and if they're all word games, as Wittgenstein said, then let's develop the best word game with the best rules that we can. All right, so let me go back and continue with, with Carl Jung. All right, so uh, the rupture between faith and knowledge is a symptom of the split consciousness, which is so characteristic of the mental disorder of our day. It is as if two different persons were making statements about the same thing, each from his own point of view, or as if one person in two different frames of mind were sketching a picture of his experience. If for person we substitute modern society, it is evident that the latter is suffering from a mental dissociation, i.e. a neurotic disturbance. In view of this, it does not help matters at all if one party pulls obstinately to the right and the other to the left. This is what happens in every neurotic psyche to its own deep distress, and it is just this distress that brings the patient to the analyst. As I stated above, the analyst has to establish a relationship with both halves of his patient's personality because only from them can he put together a whole and complete man and not merely one half by suppression of the other. So I, I think that paragraph is one of the best summaries of our current situation. A mental dissociation, a neurotic disturbance of this collective mind, one half pulling obstinately to the right, the other to the left, this is my right and this is my left. But that tension, which is tearing the nation apart, also is creating the energy that's pulling the compensatory mandala image up from our collective unconscious mind. The collective unconscious mind, I'm saying, is the cosmic horizon, where the past, the present, and the future exist at every point, and from whence they are projected in to create this holographic illusion. That understanding of the relationship between the self and the cosmos is the antidote to this mental disorder of our day, to this neurotic dis disturbance, this mental dissociation between the left and the right. To become a whole individuated individual person, you have to first meet the minimum demands of society and your instinctive demands of your body, and then later in life, withdraw your autonomy from those demands and then re-embrace them on the understanding that everything and everyone emerges from the archetype of the self or the God archetype. That's much more scientifically plausible in the context of a comparison of Jungian psychology culminating with the mandala image of the archetype of the self and holographic string theory culminating with the inside out black hole mandala of the universe with its holographic information conservation at the horizon and the central singularity. That mandala image of the cosmos and the psyche that's emerging is the predictable compensation for this neurotic mental dissociation that is destroying the United States of America. This is what I'm arguing. 
So continuing, um, well, this is the end of this segment that I'll be going over. I say, according to Jung, to activate our full potential as human beings, or in other words, to individuate ourselves, we must embrace all of the archetypes. The only way to do which is to see how they all radiate from and return to the ultimate archetype of wholeness through the union of opposites, which most people in America call God. All right, so that will be enough for this video. I'm going to click over here. All right, and uh, in the next video, I'll be going over Leo Strauss's natural right and history.